Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Wednesday, July 8th. Once again, uh, today in this, uh, on this day in 1942, the Lutheran Women's Missionary League was organized and we recognize them and thank God for them today. The Lutheran Women's Missionary League is the ones that collect those boxes of loose change among uh, many, many other things they do, uh, missionary work throughout the world as well as here at home. So we uh, thank God for them today. Let's go ahead and begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of the glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. The Lord is my cho chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Our New Testament reading tonight is a continuation of our readings from the book of Acts, chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. No, that's not right. It is the book of Acts, chapter 13, beginning in verse 42, uh, where we left off yesterday. My apologies. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to er eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing, and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them, and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And our... Uh, Book of Concord reading, as we uh, spoke earlier, is going to be from the Small Called Articles now. Uh, that would be the last part of the Book of Concord, which Martin Luther wrote. And we'll be in that for the next uh, few weeks. Uh, tonight we are going to hear uh, some of the background and then Martin Luther's preface to uh, the articles themselves. For most of the 15th century, 
Uh, the papacy had striven to reverse the decrees made at a council called the Council of Constance, uh, which placed conciliar authority on the level of papal authority, uh, which is one of the things the Reformation uh, tried to undo. The Fifth Lateran Council, meeting in 1511 to 1512, had been securely under papal control. Pope Leo X had little interest in the need for reform and failed to take seriously the monk's quarrel, as he called it, in Germany. And his successor, Pope Adrian VI, came from the reformed-mind circles around uh, Erasmus in the Netherlands, but he was only pope for about 20 months, and that didn't give him any time uh, to overcome any of the objections uh, within the uh, curia to serious reform effort. Uh, his successor, the uh, Medici Pope Clement VII, was not able to organize reform, and thus Pope Paul III was faced with the need to do so when he ascended to the papal throne in 1534. In June of 1536, he called for a general council to meet in Mantua in May of 1537 and launched a diplomatic offensive to bring German princes and their theologians to that council. Uh, international and ecclesiastical politics delayed the opening of that until December of 1545, when it was convened in the Episcopal city of Trent, uh, south of the Alps, but still part of the Holy Roman Empire. And the Council of Trent, uh, you may have heard of from uh, world history when he took world history in school. Uh, now, although he thought it was pointless to attend that kind of papal council, the Saxon elector Martin Luther's uh, elector Martin Luther's prince uh, from Saxony, John Frederick Frederick the Wise, uh, had long wanted Luther to compose a, a, a doctrinal last will and testament, a clear statement of his positions on all of the critical religious issues of the time, and the closing section of another uh, book that he wrote called The Confession Concerning Christ's Supper in 1528 uh, presented just such a thing. Uh, but in this new situation, the elector wanted another similar confession of faith for Martin Luther. And at the same time, he recognized that such a document could be a youth, useful summary of the Lutheran position uh, for submission to the papal council. And so on the 11th of December in 1536, he commissioned Luther to assemble a group of theologians, uh, similar to the one he assembled in 1530, to draft uh, a memorandum for the Diet of Augsburg, which we know as the Augsburg Confession. This group was to assist the uh, ailing Luther, he was in poor health at the time, in running a summary, writing a summary statement of the Evangelical Confession, and that included uh, such folks as Nicholas von Amsdorf, uh, John Agricola, George Spalatin, and uh, Luther's colleagues from Wittenberg, Philip Melanchthon, Justice Jonas, Caspar Krusiger Jr., and John Bugenhagen. So they uh, assembled at the Black Cloister in Wittenberg, that's Luther's house, uh, at the end of December, and acted as a sounding board for the reformer uh, for his writing, which became known as the Small Called Articles. Uh, in contrast, to the overview of Luther's theology uh, that served as the conclusion of that book, Confession Concerning Christ's Supper, which arranged Luther's teaching according to the outline of the Apostles' Creed, the small called articles began with a confession of ancient Trinitarian doctrine on which both the papal uh, theologians and the Lutherans agreed uh, fully. And the second section of the document confessed Luther's teaching on what he viewed as the heart of the message of the Bible, which is Christ's atoning work and the concept of trust, uh, topics on which he saw no hope of agreement because the Roman position on the Mass and other abuses such as the doctrines of purgatory, uh, pilgrimages, relics, and the invocation of the saints, as well as views on monastic life and on the papacy. A third section treated a series of doctrinal topics on which Luther hoped the theologians could find common formulation of biblical truth. And the doc, uh, document was structured to present Luther's teaching to uh, the council. Now, written records of the time uh, suggest that there was some sharp disagreement 
uh, between his colleagues and Luther's draft, uh, particularly on the Lord's Supper, the group struggled to arrive at the simple confession that the bread and wine in the supper are the true body and blood of Christ. And the group suggested some changes, uh, including the addition of the section on the invocation of saints and some other uh, material in it. Now, the small called articles were presented to the Lutheran princes in February of 1537 at the meeting of the Defensive League that they had ordered, uh, organized back in 1531. They decided to use the Augsburg Confession and its apology as the basis of their presentation at the Council, rather than Luther's articles. Uh, Melanchthon had expressed some reservations regarding the suitability of the articles as a public confession. Uh, most of the theologians, however, did subscribe uh, to the document, accepting it as their uh, confession of faith. And Luther wrote a preface outlining his program for reform uh, for the following year, the year 1538. And the uh, articles were then printed with a translation of Philip Melanchthon's uh, paper called The Treatise on the Power and Primacy of the Pope, uh, which were attached as a sort of appendix to it. And that revision also had some various changes uh, and secretarial type of things to the uh, different portions. And then in 1544, the small called articles were accepted uh, in parts of Hesse as a defining confession of the church alongside the Augsburg Confession. And during the 1550s, the articles were used increasingly often, particularly among a group called the Genesio Lutherans, uh, theologians who were called the, the genuine uh, Lutherans, as an authoritative confessional document. And, of course, after all that, it was natural that, that, that both the small called articles uh, and the treatise on the power and primacy of the Pope would be uh, bound up into what eventually became the Book of Concord. And just quick aside about these Genesio Lutherans, like why did the Lutherans have little different groups? Because they were disagreeing among themselves uh, already. And that is the reason why we have follow-up confessions uh, like the uh, Formula of Concord. Because after the Reformation started, uh, the Lutherans argued among themselves and started to become divided. And then eventually uh, you had other divisions which became uh, the Reformed Church. Uh, which eventually would become such groups as the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Episcopalians, and so forth. Uh, so now begins the small called article, articles themselves. The small called articles, articles of Christian doctrine, which were to have been presented by our side at the council in Mantua, or wherever else it was to have met, and which were to indicate what we could or could not accept or give up, etc., written by Dr. Martin Luther in the year 1537. The Preface of Dr. Martin Luther Pope Paul III called a council to meet at Mantua last year around Pentecost. Afterward, he moved it from Mantua so that it is still not known where he intends to hold it or whether he can hold it. We, on our side, had to prepare for the eventuality that, whether summoned to the council or not, we would be condemned. I was therefore instructed to compose and assemble articles of our teaching in case it came to negotiations about what and how far we would or could compromise with the papists, and in which things we definitely intended to persist and remain firm. Consequently, I assembled these articles and submitted them to our side. They were also accepted and unanimously confessed by us, and it was resolved that they should be publicly submitted and presented as the confession of our faith should the Pope and his adherents ever become so bold as to convene a truly free council, in a serious and genuine spirit, without deception and treachery, as would be his duty. But the Roman court is so dreadfully afraid of a free council and so shamefully flees from the light, that it has deprived even those who are on the Pope's side of the hope that he will ever tolerate a free council, much less actually convene one. They are understandably greatly offended and are quite troubled when they observe that the Pope would rather see all of Christendom lost and every soul damned than to allow himself or his followers to be reformed even a little and to permit limits on his tyranny. Therefore, I still wanted to publicize these articles through the public press 
in case, as I fully expect and hope, I should die before a council could take place. For the scoundrels who flee from the light and avoid the day are taking such great pains to postpone and hinder the council. I wanted to do this so that those who live and remain after me will have my testimony and confession to present, in addition to the confession that I have already published, and that would be the confession concerning Christ's Supper of 1528. I have held fast to this confession until now, and, by God's grace, I will continue to hold it. What should I say? Why should I complain? I am still alive every day I write, preach, and teach. Yet there are such poisonous people, not only among our adversaries, but also unfaithful associates. Uh, literally, uh, that word that he used there, I believe this was written originally in Latin. Uh, the word he uses there literally is called false brother, and he was referencing uh, Galatians 2.4. Uh, but also unfaithful associates who want to be on our side and who dare to use my writings and teaching directly against me. They let me look on and listen, even though they know that I teach otherwise. They want to conceal their poison under my work and mislead the poor people by using my name. What will happen in the future after my death? I suppose I should respond to everything while I am still living, but then again, how can I alone stop all the mouths of the devil? especially those, for they are all poisoned, who do not want to listen or pay attention to what we write. Instead, they devote all their energy to one thing, how they might shamefully twist and corrupt our words down to the very letters. I will let the devil, or ultimately God's wrath, answer them as they deserve. I often think of the good Gerson, who doubted whether one should make good writings public. If one does not, then many souls that could have been saved are neglected. But if one does, then the devil is there with innumerable vile evil mouths that poison and distort everything so that it bears no fruit. Still, what they gain is seen in the light of day, for although they so shamelessly slandered us and wanted to keep the people on their side with their lies, God has continually furthered his work, has made their number less and less, while our number grows larger and larger and has allowed and continues to allow them and their lies to come to naught. I must tell a story. A learned doctor, uh, and that doctor he's referring to is a name, man named Gervasius Wame, uh, who was trained under a fellow named John Eck, uh, Luther's opponent, and was a legate for uh, Francis I of France, uh, who came to Saxony in 1531. I must tell a story. A learned doctor who came to Wittenberg from France stated publicly in our presence that his king was persuaded beyond the shadow of a doubt that there was no church, no government, and no marriage among us, but rather that everyone carried on with each other like cattle and all did what they wanted. Now imagine how will those people who in their writings have represented as pure truth such gross lies to the king and to other countries face us on the day before the judgment seat of Christ. Christ, the Lord and judge of all, knows quite well that they lie and have lied. They will have to hear his judgment. That I know for sure. May God bring to repentance those who can be converted. For the rest, there will be eternal suffering and woe. To return to the subject, I would indeed very much like to see a true council, in order to assist with a variety of matters and to aid many people. Not that we need it, for through God's grace our churches are now enlightened and supplied with the pure word and right use of the sacraments, an understanding of the various walks of life and true works. Therefore, we do not ask for a council for our sakes. In such matters, we cannot hope for or expect any improvement from the council. Rather, we see in bishoprics everywhere so many parishes empty and deserted, that our hearts are ready to break. And yet neither bishops nor cathedral canons ask how the poor people live or die, people for whom Christ died. And should not these people hear this same Christ speak to them as the true shepherd with his sheep? It horrifies and frightens me that Christ might cause a council of angels to descend upon Germany and totally destroy us all like Sodom and Gomorrah, because we mock him so blasphemously with the council. 
In addition to such necessary concerns of the church, there are also countless important matters in worldly affairs that need improvement. There is disunity among the princes and the estates. Greed and usury have burst in like a great flood and have attained a semblance of legality. Wantonness, lewdness, extravagant dress, gluttony, gambling, conspicuous consumption with all kinds of vice and wickedness, disobedience of subjects, servants, laborers, extortion by all the artisans and the peasants, who can list all these things, have so gained the upper hand that a person could not set things right again with ten councils and twenty imperial diets. If participants in the council were to deal with the chief concerns in the spiritual and secular estates that are opposed to God, then their hands would be so full that they would forget all about the child's games and fool's play of long robes, great tonsures, broad cinctures, bishops and cardinals' hats, croiziers, and similar clowning around. If we had already been following God's command and precepts in the spiritual and secular estates, then we would have found the spare time to reform food, vestments, tonsures, and chasubles. But if we swallow such camels and strain out gnats or let logs stand in dispute about specks, then we might just as well be satisfied with such a council. I therefore have provided only a few articles because in any case we have already received from God so many mandates to carry out in the church, in the government, and in the home that we can never fulfill them. What is the point, what is the use of making so many decretals and regulations in the council, especially if no one honors or observes the chief things commanded them by God? It is as if God had to honor our buffoonery, while in return we trample his solemn commands underfoot. In fact, our sins burden us and prevent God from being gracious to us, because we do not even repent, and moreover, we want to defend every abomination. O oh, dear Lord Jesus Christ, hold a council of your own and redeem your people through your glorious return. The Pope and his people are lost. They do not want you. Help us who are poor and miserable, who sigh to you and earnestly seek you, according to the grace you have given us through your Holy Spirit, who with you and the Father lives and reigns, forever praised. Amen. And that is the end of uh, Luther's preface. Uh, you can see that in his writing, that's not uh, churchly writing, when he's not writing the actual articles and things about the faith. Uh, it's kind of a wry sense of humor and quite a bit of derision uh, for, for the Pope and his lackeys. Uh, not because of the church itself, but because of uh, the hypocrisy that he saw in them. Uh, and that's why he was kind of making fun of the long robes, uh, the great tonsures, that's the monks shaved this whole portion of their head. So they only have this fringe going around, if, if you have hair. They have this fringe that goes around uh, as a mark of, of their holiness and so forth. And then the hats, the crosses and staffs they carried around and so forth. So that's enough about that. And we will get into the actual meat of the Small Called Articles tomorrow which is a great, great confession of faith. I hope you will enjoy uh, hearing it, and it will encourage you to uh, keep on uh, listening to the parts of the Book of Concord. But that is all for tonight. Okay, we now continue with the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, 
forever and ever. Amen. And our Wednesday prayer, as always, is the shorter litany. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us. Spare all the dying. From all sin, from all evil, from the devil's might, from the devil's wiles, from your wrath and from hell's torment, from sudden and evil death, good Lord, deliver them. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, help them, good Lord. In the hour of death, on the day of judgment, help them, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, good Lord. To comfort all the dying, to forgive them all their sins, to lead them out of this misery into eternal life, we implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. Almighty God, you brought joy to Gentiles and persecution to Paul and Barnabas through their proclamation that Jesus is a light to all nations, to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Give us courage to proclaim the gospel throughout the world, even in the face of opposition, knowing it is through suffering that we enter the kingdom of God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Good night.